Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Brad. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, to speak about this subject. Actually, I, what Brad didn't say is that uh, I started to work on topological waves in collaboration with him and another colleague in France, Pierre Delplace. And uh, also my PhD was uh, with Freddy in Nice and Joel Samaria in Grenoble. Actually, I was in Grenoble, not in Lyon, but that's fine. It's from here, it's very close. <laughs> so uh, it's equivalent. Uh, so I will speak about topological fluid waves across scales. Uh, I wrote some uh, notes that you can uh, read. I think it's uh, on the website. And uh, I will start by a phenomenon that let's look at it. So you see uh, the temperature anomaly at the surface of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, you know, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, there is the El Nino phenomenon, which happens when uh, uh, it's warmer than usual in Peru. And when you saw is in, in this video, is that one month before uh, the El Nino event, uh, there is an anomaly, uh, red, uh, it's positive temperature anomaly that goes from one side to the ocean to the other without much backscattering. So it is an, uni an unidirectional wave. It is trapped at the equator. And this is really uh, impressive, this phenomenon. Because when you throw a stone on water, you have waves going in every direction. If you throw a big stone at the equator, some of the waves go in all the directions. But in some frequency range, you have energy that can be propagated only uh, toward the east. There are two wave modes that propagate energy over some frequency toward the east. This one, which is called an equatorial Kevin wave, this red uh, uh, positive temperature anomaly that crossed the Pacific Ocean in one month, and another one which is anti-symmetric for the temperature with respect to the equator. So that's a fact. And the question is why? Why two? Why two unidirectional modes trapped at the equator? So that's one thing. Another thing. So this is still the ocean. But now you see uh, tides. So uh, more precisely, you will see uh, tides, uh, the surface, so this is sea surface elevation that is uh, filtered so that you can see only the components corresponding to the forcing by the moon. Okay, this is called M2 ocean tides. And you see the structure of the response. So the, the response is a superposition of modes. But what I want to point out is first, it's a bit complicated. It's not the two bulge uh, tide that we learn in textbook, in introductory textbook, because of the continent, it's complicated. But despite the fact that it is complicated, you can notice some robust feature. And in particular, a look here in South America, you have these trapped waves that goes only in one direction. And look uh, at the lake here. You have a, uh, yeah, sorry, Hudson <laughs> Bay. <laughs> I'm a very bad oceanographer. <laughs> you get also a trap mode that goes in the cyclonic direction. And in fact, if you got uh, any, uh, uh, either a closed ocean basin or a lake that is sufficiently large, you will see uh, those uh, modes that are trapped and that goes in a cyclonic manner. So spinning as uh, uh, in the same direction uh, as the Earth. Okay, so in that case, there is only one mode that is trapped and that is unidirectional. And the question is why and is it related to those equatorial waves? So first, there is a semantic relation is that those uh, waves are called coastal Canyon waves. 
And because they are very similar to the one that are observed at the equator that were discovered later, the other I call by analogy equatorial Kelvin waves. And in fact, uh, unidirectional waves trapped at interface here, the equator or boundary. So this is a laboratory ocean or lake. This is a tabletop experiment. And uh, uh, when it is rotating, you can observe trapped mud with uh, the boundary of the experiment. We will come back to it later. Uh, at much smaller scale, you have similar phenomena that are expected, uh, for instance, in uh, um, film, uh, two-dimensional films of uh, helium-3 in phase uh, A. Uh, they are uh, trapped mud, unidirectional at the boundary. And at very large scale, so here there is a question mark because it is a, um, uh, an active resource, research subject. Uh, we may wonder whether there are any directional states in the spectrum or uh, stellar oscillations. We heard this morning, and I think you heard the week before about helio seismology. It's a very important question to be able uh, to deduce some property of the interior of the stars by observing the fluctuation of the uh, of pressure at the exterior. And uh, maybe uh, there are some unidirectional waves in this system to be found. The point here is that whatever uh, the scale you look at waves, fluid wave or continuous media, you will have unidirectional waves. And a common point between those, all those examples is that there is some symmetry that are broken. Here, time symmetry. This is uh, kind of obvious because uh, uh, the waves head in only one direction. But we will see in the lecture that it can be related to the, uh, to the model that describes the, those waves. And that those symmetry will play a very important role. And if you, actually, I spoke about fluids, but uh, those kind of edge modes, uh, they are so commonly encountered in condensed matter. And if you look, if you show one of the movies here uh, uh, that I showed you before to your condensed matter friends, they will say it looks like topological insulators. So what are those topological insulators? They are um, uh, materials, a bit exotic, because if you forget about boundaries, so in the bulk, in the interior, uh, they are uh, isolant. Uh, you cannot, uh, they are insulators. Uh, because you cannot propagate uh, electron in soft band uh, of energy or frequency. You have wave bands, and in between, you have, you have gaps. And within these gaps, you cannot uh, propagate electrons. But as soon as you stack uh, one of those uh, uh, topological uh, material, topological insulator with another material, which is trivial, which is a normal insulator, you will have the uh, you will be able to uh, conduct electricity very efficiently at the interface because there will be unidirectional modes trapped at the interface. So keep this picture in mind. So at this stage, it's very abstract, but I will uh, be more concrete later in the lecture. And the only thing I want to say here is that uh, there has been a machinery, a theoretical machinery that have been developed in this context that can be adapted to the case of fluids. And uh, the two key points is that it's possible to predict the number of modes that are trapped at the interface without having to, compl to compute the whole spe the spectrum of the problem that can be complicated because you have two different systems. Uh, you may realize the, the interface in different ways. This interface can be uh, very, uh, very corrugated. And Whatever those properties, it's possible to predict that there, be, that there will be one, two, three, n modes that are trapped. And by computing a bulk property that depends only on this material and only on this material. So in the lecture, we'll show you how to compute those bulk properties and how they are related to the existence of unidirectional modes. And one very important uh, understanding from the study has been the role of discrete symmetries in the problem. Is time reversal symmetry? Is inversion or mirror symmetry broken or not? Display a major role in the existence or not of edge modes 
uh, that fill the frequency gap very, uh, between the wave bands of the insulator. So I will not say much about uh, those uh, topical insulators, but you're welcome to look at, uh, there is a, a video, the Harry Nobel, that you can look on YouTube, uh, where two of my colleagues are involved. Uh, they are English subtitles, it's in French, but they are English subtitles. And it's very pedagogical, and you will see the link with Quantas uh, uh, Hall effect uh, by looking at this lecture. I will not say more about this, but just advertisement. And so I, talk you, uh, I, I told you about topological insulator, but at this stage, where is topology? So uh, I will say only basic things about topology because I, I, don't, I do not know uh, much more than those basic things. And but uh, in a simple way to introduce topology is, is to say that you will classify objects into different family and it will allow you to um, transform complicated objects into simpler one and so transform complicated problem into sim simpler one. It's easier to make computation on the torus than uh, uh, on a cup, and that will be the, the idea. But the objects uh, that will be useful in this lecture, they are not the surface itself, it's not the surface of the, the material. Uh, there are some other objects. So here is an example of another object. Uh, sorry for the typo here from a William Irvin group in uh, Chicago. So what you see is a kind of a knot structure that uh, is allowed to vi visualize a, a filament of vorticity. And uh, this filament of vorticity is knotted and it's related to the helicity invariant that was introduced this, this morning. So here is an another object related to topology. And actually uh, there are books on topological uh, fluids mechanics that, uh, uh, that uh, spend a lot of time on those objects. But that will, be not, that will not be the object of the lecture. The object of is three, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's a knot in three dimensions, yes. So the helicity invariant is an invariant for three dimensional turbulence. And uh, the helicity invariant is related to the number of nodes or links in those, uh, those vorticity filaments. This, this is very interesting, and it started with uh, the work, those idea of nodes and vorticity with Kelvin. And the invariant was uh, rediscovered many times, but really it, it, the, the, its physical importance uh, was highlighted by Moffat uh, in the 60s. And uh, the object related to this lecture will be more than those. Uh, bundle of vectors, bundles because you get a surface, and on the top of it, this surface, you have vectors. So here, those are a vector tangent to the surface. Uh, so real vector in the lecture, the vector will be complex because there will be eigenmodes. But really the object that will be topological in the lecture uh, will be those kind of object, a surface in some space, will be parameter space and vectors on the top of this surface that will be complex vector. And just as uh, you can classify surface with the number of uh, uh, holes uh, or handles uh, you get uh, in it, you can classify those objects for a given sur surface with the numbers of uh, uh, singularities you get on it. This is uh, the only thing uh, I will say on the slides, but last point, why is it important to learn about those topological waves? Okay, the first thing is that in uh, whatever uh, the domain you are coming from, if you're interested in two continuous media, uh, you will see uh, the, start, the, the first chapters of the book, you will see a spectrum of waves. In many times, there are many wave bands with waves that fill the gaps between the bands, and probably there is some relation with the topological environment. Uh, the issue comes from condensed matter, you are probably used to those topological uh, uh, insulator um, theory. But it, it, it I think it is interesting to, to go to fluids and more generally to continuous media because what you think was understood was is perhaps uh, not so clear in this context. So you need to adapt the concept in the fluid case. 
and to it helps you to think about uh, uh, those concepts more generally. So uh, there is a theoretical interest to go back to Fleet. And uh, the last point is that by uh, transforming complicated problems into simpler one, you may be able to discover some kind of new waves based on some criterion of uh, your system uh, that you're working on. Okay, so that's it for the, the slides. Right. And so, uh, no, I wanted to give you uh, the outline. Up. Anyway, I will give you the outline later, no? It works. Okay. So the idea is that for this lecture, and maybe uh, a little bit the next lecture, I want to present you the simplest possible case uh, where we see some topological feature that emerge in fluid context, which is the equatorial waves. And most of the lecture will be actually uh, 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 to derive the spectrum of equatorial wave, which is a work done by Matt Snow in the 60s. Then uh, I will speak about those coastal waves because this case is a bit more complicated and uh, it helps us to think about the concept introduced in the simplest case. And in the last lecture, uh, I would like to spend a new, uh, so some time on the new results uh, that intend to explain the correspondence between topological properties of waves and the emergence of unidirectional modes. Because in most studies, even in condensed matter, there is a computation of a topological property, computation of a spectrum with waves that fill a gap between different wave bands. And then uh, it's a bit magical. There is a theorem, index theorem that is invoked. And that say, oh, these num topological numbers should be equal to this uh, wave property in the complicated system. And I would like to give a physical interpretation to this theorem based on ray tracing. Okay, so let's go for the first lecture. And uh, the first lecture is really based on the work uh, done with uh, Brad and another colleague in Lyon, uh, Pierre Delplace, that comes from uh, Quantum Matter, worked on uh, graphene. So let's start with material uh, ways. And the aim of the lecture is to show the topological origin of the waves involved uh, in uh, uh, this El Nino phenomenon. So the problem of equatorial waves, I think it's fair to, to say that it started uh, with Laplace. And uh, in the uh, Traité du Monde, in a chapter 10, sur les flux et les reflux de la mer, uh, so on the, the, the sea, say, I will uh, attack uh, one of uh, the most thorny, épineux, thorny uh, problem of celestial mechanics, which is, <laughs> and so he said, okay, I will consider a net, which is a rotating. And it's interesting because it's rotating and he wrote down the Coriolis force before Coriolis. So it's rotating. And he said, the ocean is rather shallow. So we will consider a thin layer of fluid. Linear fluid, H much smaller than the radius of the planet. This is very important because then we have a small parameter and that simplifies the equation, the three dimensional uh, Euler equation that were introduced in previous lecture. And then we get the shallow water model. That's what Laplace wrote, and that's what we will write uh, soon. And one thing I want to emphasize is that a key parameter called the Coriolis parameter introduced by Laplace is uh, the projection of the rotation vector of the planet on the local vertical axis. So let's call it that way. So this is F, this Coriolis parameter. This will be really an important parameter of the problem, omega dot 
is sous omega sine theta, theta is the latitude. And so let's draw it. So it goes from two omega to minus two omega. So here it's Y and in red is F. And what I want to emphasize, and this is really important, we have an interface here between a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere where F is positive here and F is negative here. This interface will be really important in the remaining of the lecture. So when I will say the interface problem, I refer to the fact that we have an equator with the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. The issue is a Laplace um, equation uh, and Laplace problem uh, written down in spherical geometry is that the equation were horrible. And actually, it occupied a, a mathematician for two centuries to solve uh, those equations. And uh, a very important contribution arrived thanks to uh, Kelvin. Uh, so one century later, probably. And Kelvin said, OK, it's too complicated. Let's consider the same planet. But instead of considering the spherical geometry, let's assume that the fluid takes place in a plane tangent to the Earth. So we're happy because then we can be in Cartesian coordinate. So I will have always use y as the northward coordinate and x as the eastward coordinate. And uh, Kelvin assume that F is constant, the curly parameter is constant. And with this simplification, he was able to uh, solve Laplace equation and uh, discuss the physics of the wave. So I will refer to this problem as the, the bulk problem. So you have to imagine that here you have a material, which is the bulk, the interior, here another one. And in Laplace problem, you stack the two bulk problem into an interface problem. It's the bulk, and here the interface. The problem with Kelvin problem, the, with a Kelvin model, is that it does not really describe equatorial wave, uh, because at the equator, this parameter vanish. So you cannot account for rotation at the equator with the effect of rotation with this model. And uh, uh, a major step was achieved by um, Matsuno. So again, one century later, who said, OK, let's keep Cartesian coordinates. But let's put this tangent plane at the equator. And instead of having the par Corliss parameter being zero, let's assume linear variations. So again, same planet. Now we took the plane tangent to the equator. And F theta y. So this is called the F plane approximation. This is called the beta plane approximation. And Matsuno, in this case, again, took Laplace tidal equation without forcing, just the fluid dynamics, and solved it. And 
so okay, beta plane approximation was used by. Uh, ah, no, no, beta plane was uh, used by uh, Rosby uh, uh, in the for mid latitude dynamics to account for the variation of curly parameter at mid latitude and explain uh, the Rosby ways. Uh, but the effect of this beta plane, uh, its importance related to Laplace tidal equation and equatorial waves is due to Matsuno. But the term beta plane was used before. He didn't coin the, this term. And uh, a striking outcome of Matsuno computation was that, indeed, in this model, there are modes that are trapped at the equator. It's called the equatorial wave guide. And so you can think of Matsuno computation as the, the simplest possible computation of the oscillation of a thin layer of fluids in flaplas tidal equations. So this is called the equatorial wave guide. This is very important. And this has often been presented as a triumph of theoretical geophysical fluid dynamics because Matsuno did the computation and almost at the same time came the observation of the waves he was computing. So uh, uh, it had a very important role then on tropical dynamics, either in the atmosphere or in the ocean, completely unrelated to the initial tidal problem. But from a theoretical point of view, this is really related. So the outline of the lecture of this lecture will be to present the Kelvin to present the model introduced by Laplace, rotating shallow water model, then the solution of Kelvin, the F plane problem, and then the solution of Matsuno. That's it. So let's start with the model. And the model will be rotating shallow water. So the starting point is three-dimensional similar equation, but we consider uh, the limit of uh, small depths, shallow water limit, and um, we have a thin layer of depths. This is the bottom. In this lecture, the bottom will be flat. We we'll like something closer to blue for the. Z is vertical direction, horizontal direction is X or Y. And this interface, I will write it as H equal eta, is the C surface elevation with respect to the to a mean depth H. And H is, so eta will be much smaller than capital H is much smaller than the horizontal length scale of the problem. And in this limit, so we have a perfect fluid here with rho, the density constant. We, are, we start with an equal fluid, constant density, uh, in viscid, no viscosity. Yes? So Uh, here, okay, here the waves, it's uh, waves in the propagating in the zonal east direction. So they are, this is horizontal motion. Yeah, so, but the, so the amplitude of the waves, is that, try to think of that as like Okay, okay. yes, yeah. yes, oh, so this like is that, it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So the waves be pointing like this. So, so here, uh, okay, yes, yes, uh, okay. Uh, I present you the simplest possible model where we have air and ocean, a barotropic ocean. But uh, if you want to put numbers of uh, then on the waves and wave speed, then you write actually, it's the interface between a layer of uh, hot water on the top of a layer of cold water. 
<laughs> okay, it's an important question too. Interface means that uh, I have a parameter here, the curly parameter that change sign at the equator. So the interface is for this parameter. I have a parameter that changes spatially and it defines an interface between a region where it is negative, a region where it is positive. Just as when you have stacked two material together, you have one material with some uh, uh, property uh, and one material with another property. Here, the property is the sign of the coordinates parameter. And bulk problem is that you take one given value of this parameter and you look at the wave property in a plane tangent to the earth with this fixed parameter. So in the limit where uh, the depth is very shallow, the fluid is hydrostatic on the uh, vertical. And uh, your three-dimensional incompressible equation can be written down as a two-dimensional compressible equation. Let's see why. The dynamic will the time derivative of u. So u will always be the velocity in uh, zonal direction and v in meridional direction. u plus u dx u v dy u minus g x eta plus f v. Same thing for v. And last thing, the mass conservation is dt eta plus dx. Write it that way. Eta plus h u plus dy eta plus h. So this is momentum equation in x direction, zonal direction, momentum equation in y direction, uh, meridional direction, and this is mass conservation. And you see in this mass conservation that the flow behaves as a comp compressible model. So you gain something by lowering the dimensionality of the flow, but you lose something because you lose uh, incompressibility. And I wrote the nonlinear term but uh, from now on to the uh, end of the three lectures, I will kill them. Everything will be linear. So, yeah. so this will be really linear physics, those lectures. And uh, now we will use some uh, rescaling. So writing, uh, U prime equal U over C, V prime equal V over C, eta prime equal eta minus H over H, and introduce the shallow water sound speed, KG at gravity constant. And uh, now that we have removed the nonlinear term, I will write the equation in a matrix form that way q prime v prime eta prime is equal to f zero x minus f zero So this is our linear problem of the day. And this is the linear problem uh, solved by Kelvin in the case where uh, F is constant. Then you get a simple problem because 
all the coefficients are constant, and you can look at the solution on the form uh, u prime is equal to u hat e k x plus e l y minus e omega t plane wave solution. That's why Kelvin uh, for n is simple. And same for eta p uh, v and uh, yeah. And uh, when you do this, you find the dispersion relation, and uh, you get a three by uh, three matrix with coefficient here. And uh, the solution are uh, one mode. Let's call it omega naught, which is uh, zero. One mode. Two mod plus and minus one, which is this. So let's plot those mod. So it's K, okay. sorry, but Omega here. There, K and L. So this is the dispersion relation of Kelvin wave problem. And you get, so one first important thing, you get an insulator, why? Yeah, just just this. This is important. There is a gap. It's given by F. So the jargon is to say F opens the gap. Because uh, we'll see why. And so the those bands of frequency, they are called inertia gravity wave. Inertia. Waves. These bands are called geostrophic mode. And okay, because we have real fields, if you get a wave here, you get the same waves on the other side here. It is pair together to make a real solution because the solution here involves the complex conjugate. So we can. Focus the discussion on those two waves. And they are also called the, sometimes Poincare. And some people call them sphere drop. So there are many names. Inertia gravity waves is nice because you see why they are called inertia. Look at this point here. The frequency here is omega equal f. Those are the inertial waves that Kate presented this morning. And why gravity? Because at very small scale, so at large wave number, the dispersion relation is just omega equal ck. This is the dispersion relation of shallow waters that you probably know. So those are gravity waves that become influenced by rotation when they are sufficiently large scale. Inertia gravity waves. Why geostrophic modes? We learned about geostrophic balance in the previous lecture. So in this flat band, so there is no propagation, but you can look at the dispersion relation. And there you see that if this term is zero, there is a balance between pressure force. So the variation of the interface is related to the variation of pressure through so hydrostatic balance. And there is a balance between Curly's force and uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure, uh, pre horizontal pressure gradient here and here. This is geostrophic balance. And this is related to the fact that when you see isoline of uh, sea surface height, for those uh, slow mode or zero frequency mode, you get information on uh, the, the flow itself because those are streamlines. And actually, this is what is used by altimetry to derive the 
uh, to infer the velocity at the surface of the oceans from the knowledge of the height of the ocean. I guess I should point out that the yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Point. Exactly. Yeah. That's what will happen. So I just want to point out something uh, I said already is that uh, if you take Kelvin problem uh, at the actor, so this is Kelvin equatorial problem in a sense, f equals zero. Then what happens? There is some singularity. And the singularity is that there is a threefold degeneracy point where the three bonds touch each other. So it's this k, omega, and, and keep in mind this degeneracy point because it will play a very important role in the following. So if you look at the maps, either in the atmosphere or in the ocean of the motion, we see that clearly it seems that rotation has an influence of the dynamics in the tropics and at the equator. So this is not satisfactory at all to say that uh, rotation is zero. So this is where Matsuno enter into the problem. So let's consider the case now F equal beta y. This is the same system of equation here, but now we have a, a partial differential equation with a coefficient that vary in one direction. So this is often complicated to solve, but uh, in this particular linear case, this is possible. And this is the important contribution of Matsuno. So what we can do first is still take advantage of the translational invariance in x direction and write that uh, u prime is equal to u till e k x minus e omega t. Same for v prime and eta prime. And now we want to solve this system of equation with this on that. So the first thing that noticed Matsuno, and this is really, I find it really nice, is that uh, you can combine those three equations. It's not uh, difficult to do this, to find a single one, a scalar equation on this form. So a scalar equation for the field V that looks like this, uh, omega square minus k square minus, no, uh, k over omega uh, minus times, okay, minus y square, Time V tilde well, and I did another simplification here that I should have told you before to go from there to there. Is that we have a one intrinsic time scale and one intrinsic length scale into the problem? So look, we have f which is beta y, beta as the dimension of one per meter, one per time. Okay, we have uh, C, the velocity uh, of uh, non rotating uh, uh, shallow water waves. And so we have a typical time 
which is a typical time which is given by one over the square root of beta c, and a typical length which is given by c over beta square root of c over beta. This is a length. This length is uh, very important because we we'll see that it corresponds to the typical uh, trapping length scale of the mode. And uh, this time is the typical time frequency of the system. But from now on, I will choose length and time unit so that this equal to one, which amounts to take beta equal one and C equal one. So this is what I did to write down this equation. So do you know this equation? What is it? Yes, and um, it's a Schrodinger, uh, a particular case of Schrodinger. Yes, it's harmonic oscillator. So we are very happy because we turned a, a problem uh, that seemed complicated to another one that someone else solved for us. So that's good. So you can call this the energy. And you know that for this problem, the solution, they are uh, Hermit parabolic cylinder function written as uh, so the energy is 2n plus 1. First important information the spectrum here for a given k, wave number in the marginal direction. The spectrum here was continuous. There are continuous range of uh, L. So uh, I'll give you a wave mode here. It is discrete. We have a discrete set of modes. So. And the other important information that we know that the field V here can be decomposed on a basis of function. So V. Let's call it. Um, Vn times Cn, and the Cn are solution of the equation given n, so they are dependent on y. A solution of the problem like this. So those functions, what do they look like? So Hn is those are the Hermit polynomial. So the first one is um, one. The second one is two y, and the second one I don't know. But the important point is that uh, there is a recursion relation to find them, and n gives you the number of zeros of the function. So let's draw them here. So here is y, and let's plot c n. So let's start with a uh, zero. zero, and now c one. This is one, and so on and so forth. <laughs> okay, it's n uh, whatever. <laughs> the key point is that those more they are trapped at the trapping length scale given by this scale. So for the waves that you observe in the atmosphere, that will be a uh, 10 degree of uh, latitude more or less. Uh, let's say the typical length scale is the thousands of kilometers, and it's shorter for the ocean. And you can look at maps of the ocean; you will see that the waves that you observe they are trapped at smaller scale because this speed, this wave speed in the ocean is smaller. So we know that it's possible. So we have a basis for scalar here. But there is a very, very, very important point I want to emphasize here is that do we get the spectrum of the problem by 
solve this scalar equation. I did on purpose wrote down the equation here on the matrix form to say that we have a multi-component wave problem. And yeah, question? Yes. Um, it's confinement. So if you go back to a, a Schrodinger equation, this what happened when uh, with the potential. Um, okay, I will try. Yes. Yes. So I, in the third lecture, uh, I will uh, try to give an answer to this question using ray tracing. So we look at how a wave packet goes around the equator. And then naturally, there will be a quantization condition uh, that to understand how this wave packet information can be transferred into an information into the spectrum of the whole system. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Uh, perhaps I repeat it. It's because it's very important. Here, omega is the frequency of the waves, not the energy. And here, the energy here is by analogy with the harmonic oscillator. It has nothing to do with the energy of the mode. Yes. We assume, we have assumed that you go from equation. Yes. Okay, from uh, the beginning, I did not discuss at all what was the forcing. It's a very good uh, question. Uh, here we look at three uh, unforced, uh, undissipated Laplace uh, equation. So uh, then uh, once you get all the free mode, you can add the forcing and decompose the forcing into modes and look at the response to the forcing like this. And, uh, that's one thing. And actually, that was the motivation of Matsuno initially, see the response to the system to forcing. And then to answer to your question with the wave packet, perhaps, uh, you can force locally a, a waves somewhere on the, on the, on the Earth. And uh, you put a wave generator, and then you follow the, the, the trajectory of your ray from your generator. So in your equation, we'll have uh, on the right-hand side, uh, uh, some uh, wind in the momentum equation that will be localized, or uh, some uh, heat uh, forcing uh, on the height equation. Doesn't seem to uh, answer your question. Ah, okay, I see what you mean. Oh, okay, very good point. Yes, yes, yes. The Earth is finite. Is finite. Okay. I didn't uh, emphasize this point. This is very important. So in the model of Matsuno, you take a, and of Kelvin, you take a plane tangent to the Earth, and you assume that the dynamics takes place in an infinite uh, medium. So you, the, this parameter K is really continuous. Then when you want to go back to the Earth, before adding the sphericity of the Earth, what you can do is take a periodic domain. And then K here uh, will be quantized. We will have, yeah. So the discreteness comes not, yeah. No, not discreteness. exactly. It's in y yes. direction, but. Uh, yes, 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 yes. In the y direction, you are infinite, but uh, uh, because of the shape of uh, your assumption of a beta plane here, you discretize the spectrum. If uh, you could uh, have taken a hyperbolic, uh, um, something that looks like a hyperbolic uh, tangent, which is a, a constant here, constant there, and then you would have continuous spectrum uh, on the top of discrete spectrum. So it's really, a, the discreteness is a property of this particular profile. And there are class of profile that we leads to discrete mode. Yes. 
so let's um, now look at the dispersion relation. And I will do this with a blackboard. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. See the guy, at this point, we can say we explain, Matsuno explained the trapping of the waves. But we want to go further. And as I told you, uh, in the problem here, uh, we look so far at the field V in the meridional direction. But I stress again that there are other fields, U, the velocity in the meridional direction, uh, in the meridional direction, in the zonal direction, and V, the field in the meridional direction, and they must not diverge. Okay? So, and so one need to check for each solution psi n for v that the other fields remain finite. And we can also check if there are solutions associated with the case where v equals zero, the possibility. So let's look at the dispersion relation. Let's know. So here is k. So again, we are on on the infinite plane. So K okay, is very continuously. And let's consider the case where N is larger or equal to one. In that case, we have to solve here this equation, which is a third order polynomial, omega square minus K square minus K over omega minus uh, equal to N plus one. So we have three solutions, one can check that for all those solutions, u and eta remains finite. And then when this is done, we can plot the variation of the frequency for those three solutions and we find this. So here is n equal one, n equal two, n equal three, one, two, three. I told you for each n, we have solved here a third order polynomial equation. So we have three solutions. And the three solutions, you can identify them with the inertia gravity. One, two, three. Ah, ah. And here with the geostrophic mode. And because of the variation of the Curly's parameter with latitude, those geostrophic modes that were flat, they, the degeneracy is lifted. And you end up with those waves that you probably encountered already in previous lecture, which, has Rosby, which are Rosby waves. So those Rosby waves are perhaps particular, even if their origin is the same. They are particular with respect to the Rosby wave that you would encounter in a mid latitude quasi ostrophic uh, model that takes into account the variation of uh, Coriolis parameter with latitude. Because the peculiarity of those waves is that they are trapped. They uh, propagate as the mid latitude case, but they are trapped at the equator. So uh, this is Rosby, this is inertia gravity wave point carré. And now let's look at the case n equals zero. N equal zero. We can check if U and V uh, remains finite. And it is the case for two of the modes, but one of, one of the other modes is unphysical because if we take this uh, solution uh, for, uh, for V and look at the, the, what is the consequence for eta and uh, U, they diverge. So we throw out this solution. So there are two solutions. And if we plot those two solutions, like this, and this, so this is zero, 
So, so those modes, they are called the mixed Rossby gravity waves because they go from the Rossby waves to the inertial gravity waves. And they are also sometimes called Yanai waves. Shorter to write because Yanai, so the story says that uh, he was sharing the same office as Matsuno at some point, and they were working on the same problem. One looking at data, the other observing uh, at the theory, and uh, they took a while to realize that they were, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not. But it says, let's spread, uh, maybe George says uh, more than me this. Uh, so let's call those the Jedi mod here. And then there is a third solution. I could quote here that we can call n equal minus one, and there will be a single one. So you take this equation, you take n equal minus one, and you assume that v v equals zero. So I told you they could uh, you could see solution with v equals zero. So this is this solution. You take in the equation above v equals zero. So this is a two by two matrix problem then, and you find one solution that looks like this. And this is the Kelvin wave, equatorial Kelvin waves. So this solution, these non-dispersive waves, is corresponds to the waves uh, you saw at the beginning of the lecture before the El Nino event, this temperature anomaly that propagates only in one direction. This is these waves. And this is very, a very peculiar wave because V equals zero. Look at those equations here on the consequence. If V equals zero took the second line of the matrix, you will see that it uh, corresponds to geospophic balance uh, where the um, uh, meridional gradient of uh, the pressure of the height eta prime is compensated by the Coriolis for F U prime. So this wave in the meridional direction, it is a uh, geostrophic uh, balance, while in the zonal east-west direction, it behaves as a non-rotating shallow water wave. The key point is that it can propagate only in one direction, not on the other. Exponential decay. So yes, so the, the, yes, this is a very important point. So I told you here, N equals zero is a uh, Gaussian for uh, the profile of V, but here I should say V equal zero. But if you look at the height profile or the velocity profile, the, uh, it is an exponential uh, profile. And I will jump on this remark because there is a structure in the polarization relation of those waves. It is quite interesting, and that is related to what will come after. So I told you that V, it can be written as a sum of a coefficient that I will not write and psi not plus a coefficient times psi one plus coefficient psi two and so on. Okay, and then it's possible to write the same decomposition for u plus eta and u minus eta. So this is the basis for L2 uh, function, in the, the, the plane, in integrable function. So I can make a similar decomposition for this field, u plus eta, and this field, u minus eta. So the coefficient will be different, but you can write it in that way. One, two, and three. Uh, sorry, it will be, okay, I should. That way. C not plus one plus two plus three one. And uh, this one will be I start here plus C not three. So if you get a solution. Here, C not, you can check that the field U plus eta associated with it is 
uh, describe that the function psi one and this one by uh, nothing, zero. There will be zero, zero, and So what I'm saying here is that if you have a solution psi one, the polarization relation tells you that you have a different coefficient here and here, but the spatial structure of this field will be the second uh, parabolic, and this one will be uh, the first one psi, psi naught, like this. And those two peculiar modes here, they involve here a mix of two modes. So here you have three solutions, three solutions, two solution and one solution. One solution with one field for U and eta, it is a Gaussian, you have two solutions and those two fields with U equal eta, which is a constraint, etc. So this is the dispersion relation. This is the polarization relation. And we see that there is a strong structure because either you can write the fields as decomposition uh, independently from each other on uh, those uh, Hermit polynomials, and you can make a mix of those fields of those fields by decomposing them on eigenmodes of the system. Because the set of eigenmodes for any k define a basis for the triplet of field U V eta. So this is the end for the Matsuno uh, uh, dispersion relation. And the very important point I want to notice on this dispersion relation is that there is a spectral flow. So we put it here. N will be the spectral flow A spectral flow is just the existence of mode that transit from one wave band to another where a parameter is varied. So K here, the zonal wave number is our parameter that we vary. We say this is a spectral flow parameter. And when you vary this parameter from minus infinity to plus infinity, what you notice is that this wave band, the Poincaré inertia gravity wave band, gains two modes. So N equal to for this wave band, we call it plus because it's a positive frequency wave band. For this wave band at the center of the Rossby waves, it loses one mode when k varies and it gains one at the end. So the net gains is zero. And here, minus two, these bonds lose loses two modes. So we have a spectral index because it's a solution, it's an index that comes from the spectral property of the operator that we, the wave operator that uh, we solve. And the observation is that uh, there is this spectral flow. And this is very imp important because there is here a bond on of frequency that was, that correspond to uh, an insulator for the Kelvin wave problem because of this uh, spectral flow the frequency band is filled by those modes, which means that there is a range of frequency when, we, when we, you excite waves with a wave generator, you can only excite waves here and here. And look at what is the uh, derivative of the frequency with K here. So the group velocity in the zonal direction, it is always positive. And this is related to this spectral flow. So this spectral flow is what we want to understand with the tools from topology. And uh, the point of this lecture is to say that instead of making all those computations that uh, are rather complicated, it's possible to come back to the initial problem computed by Kelvin. We looked at the dispersion relation, but I didn't wrote down the polarization relation, the, how the different fields are related together for Kelvin. I did it for Matsuno, but it's simpler to do it for Kelvin because all parameters will be constant. Yes? So where does that go? Where can it come? 
uh, this stage, I didn't explain at all. Oh, uh, this is what I want to do now. Yes. And so we want to do to look at the polarization relation of Kelvin wave problem, the bulk problem, to understand the spectral flow that comes up in the dual Matsuno problem, interface problem where F varies. Uh, yes. So that's the key point is that here it's a peculiar, like a normal form uh, computation in the sense that is the simplest possible uh, uh, shape we could uh, take for uh, F uh, to solve this problem. And it is solvable in that case. And the, 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 the point to look for topological invariance is to be able to say after having uh, related the topological invariant to this spectral index that actually the result of this normal form will be true for any profile F here that satisfies some property. So that's the, that's the, I, for this problem that the key interest of topology is to be able to say the global shape of this spectrum in the sense that the structure of, uh, of the spectrum with modes that are gained are lost by the different wave does not depend on the particular profile for the core list parameter. And it is even more than this is that it's possible to make the computation in a simple case and to say that most salient property will be transferred to more complicated case that we cannot solve. There are other questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so was asking, can you focus on scanning the spatial one way to look at the spatial? Yes, uh, yes, it's a good, uh, I will, um, okay, I will put it there. Okay, you get it here, the structure. So the arrow is the velocity. Uh, and so you see, this is the Kelvin waves. So uh, the dashed and the plane line are height, positive and negative. And so it's like a compression uh, waves, the Kelvin waves, like the sound waves, the surface waves. I told you it's geostrophic balance in the meridional direction and propagate as a one dimensional uh, uh, surface waves not influenced by rotation. So it is trapped at the equator. And this is the, so this is psi not for U and for eta. Okay, and uh, this, okay, I, uh, perhaps it will help to answer the question. This is the mode n equal minus one, n equal zero, n equal one, because what counts is the index for V. So for the mod n equal minus one, u plus eta is c naught, so it's a Gaussian, so it's trapped at the equator. And uh, because u minus eta is zero, u, u equal eta. So this is a Gaussian and this is for u and this is a Gaussian for eta. And this is the structure of the Yai wave, mixed Rossby gravity waves. Uh, where V in, is non zero, V is a Gaussian, but uh, you see that uh, the structure is more complicated for U and eta because it's a mix of uh, uh, psi naught and psi one. Does it answer to your question? Okay. Yes. The subscript N. Okay, 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 uh, pl okay. Uh, this subscript plus zero and minus is to refer to the positive inertia gravity wave bond, this bond with the plus. The flat bond of Kelvin, the geostrophic mode is the knot. And uh, a minus is for the minus of a negative frequency Poincare wave bond. There are three wave bonds. And to refer to, the wave, to those wave bonds, in this lecture and in the others, I will take plus for this one, zero not for this one, and minus for this one. It's an index for the wave band. We have three wave bands. And uh, uh, if you wish, when you solve the um, third order polynomial, we have three solutions. The largest one is plus, the smallest one is minus, and the intermediate one is not. So now the idea is to step back to uh, 
to Kelvin. Kelvin problem. And actually, I will use first this black one because there is something I want to reuse. Let's keep this. 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 So in Kelvin uh, problem, I plotted the dispersion relation, but schematically, it's more metaphoric than anything else, but these, those arrows, they represent, they say that in, any, at any point here, I have not only a value for the frequency, but a polarization relation for the Kelvin wave problem. Okay, for instance, like this, at any point. So those arrows, they are metaphoric because they are three component complex number. Okay, I don't know how to draw this. Yes. So it's possible to do this for each wave bound, the plus, zero, the minus. And uh, our aim now is to find a topological index in these Kelvin problems and to look at this index and to notice that it is related to the spectral flow index. So what we will look at is a parameter space with F, the coreless uh, parameter frequency, K, the, the, um, the zonal wave number, and L, the meridional wave number. So we will consider, say, this wave band, then this one, then this one. But let's start with this one. So it's just for the wave bond plus. So is this wave bond uh, well defined everywhere? No. <laughs> because as I told you before, when F is equal to zero, all the bond touch each other. So I cannot distinguish them. So there is a singularity in this parameter space. And the object we want to describe is a surface that enclosed this parameter. Take a surface in parameter space. And on each point of this surface, I will look at the dispersion relation. So we look at a vector psi psi plus which is equal to u plus v plus eta plus. So here is the dispersion relation. Here is the polarization relation. And we want to look at this object. Okay. And uh, I think I will uh, start the, the, the next lecture at this point. And I would like just to show you more about uh, observation maybe to finish with the Matsuno spectrum. And so next time, uh, unless I have uh, more time uh, now, let's see with uh, Brad. But I don't want to, uh, uh, up, I skip this. I want to insist on the observation because we will go back to the topological index, but I showed you at the beginning movies uh, of the waves in the ocean. But what is really, really striking is that you can think of the atmosphere as something uh, very turbulent, uh, and it is. But despite of this, here, everything was linear. The computation of Matsuno was linear. And it turns out, and this is a, a work long ago after uh, uh, Matsuno, at the end of the 90s, by Willer Kiladis, and George Kiladis is here, uh, who uh, plotted spectrum of uh, uh, planetary scale uh, uh, atmospheric uh, fluctuation. They look at the emission, uh, the radiation due to cloud. There is something called the temperature brightness. Uh, when uh, the uh, microwaves are emitted for high uh, altitude, uh, it's colder. And uh, so when the temperature uh, is uh, smaller, 
it means that uh, we see it, it has been emitted by a region where there are a lot of clouds. And using those data, it's possible to obtain information at planetary scales on the, on the waves. And uh, you can average data uh, along uh, uh, latitude uh, up, um, northward of the equator, southward of the equator, take the sum and the difference. It gives you the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part. And this is after some filtering uh, what you get. And those lines, they are different fit for uh, the, the phase speed uh, C uh, to uh, fit uh, with the, the data, uh, to fit a shallow water model uh, on, those, uh, on those data. And what is really interesting is that you see a strong footprint of these Yanai mixed cross gravity waves and also uh, on the Kelvin waves on the top of other waves. And this is really striking that, uh, okay, uh, this is not the full dispersion relation that was plotted by Matsuno, but linear theory in that case at, planet, at planetary scale does, uh, does at lowest order a very good job at representing the, the data. And using those data, uh, you can also extract the structure of the waves. And again, I find it very impressive that uh, you see the structure of the Kelvin waves from observation uh, in the atmosphere with the, remember the trapping and the structure of uh, compression waves in the uh, meridional, uh, in the zonal di direction. Uh, so I can either take question uh, or um, start to introduce uh, the topology part uh, as you wish. Uh, one. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, it's a good point because I started with a case uh, where, with a wave in the ocean and in the ocean, uh, uh, first you are not infinite. Uh, so it's quantized the value of uh, K and on the top of it, you get a cost. And so this theory is an effective description uh, for the, what happens at the middle of the ocean. You take a box. It's another story uh, to take into account the cost. Uh, uh, it's no, 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 well, you see, okay, uh, you see something that looks like a Kelvin wave, a Yanai wave that propagates like a wave train, but with a wave envelope on the top of it. And what is said here does not work to explain uh, the, the, the reflection at the coast, uh, because at the coast, we have a coastal Kelvin wave that will... Uh, Um, no, it's, uh, it's a bit, the, it's the same issue because you can take a problem with a cost which is infinite in the, um, in the zonal direction. Like um, uh, you take a circle of uh, latitude, your cost, and then in, you look at the wave problem in the meridional direction. You have something uh, invariant uh, along the latitude circle and you get a Kelvin wave problem that uh, is similar to this uh, equatorial wave problem, but with a cost instead of an interface. And, but then the issue is what happens when uh, the, you get the cost in the, on the top of it in the meridional direction. Um, alors, I'm not sure to get the question, but first for the atmosphere, there is no cost. So there is no issue. And then for the ocean, uh, it depends the problem you're looking at. If, if you want to take the full problem uh, for the, ocean, the response of the ocean uh, on Earth, uh, the global response of the, the global structure of the spectrum, yes, you need to take into the cost, into account the, the cost. And, and then it's... Uh, 
uh, another class of problem than this one because either you add boundary condition, I will come back to this in the next lecture, uh, or you model the cost as a, a variation of the ocean floor, and then uh, uh, the equation is not, are not here anymore, but it will amount uh, to add another parameter into the problem. But this is possible. Yes. 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 Uh, the Kelvin waves in, is this one. So U plus eta are plus eta are uh, finite. Uh, v equal zero and u equal eta. Ah, sorry. Uh, here I said there is one mode. Here there are two modes, and three modes and three modes because the, you have uh, three values possible for omega with this structure for the polarization relation. So n is here. N equal minus one, zero, one, two. Because n is the index for v here, while here uh, those uh, numbers as the, are the number of solution with this structure of the with this structure of the dispersion relation. So for the generic value of uh, n uh, greater than uh, one, you always have three solution for having this structure. Two of them are uh, those one. And the central one is this one. But for n equals zero, you get two solutions that correspond to uh, the EMA wave, this one and this one. And for the Kelvin waves, you get just one solution. I should say thanks for putting this question. I should say something about unidirectional and direction of waves because there can be a lot of confusion. It dip, when I say unidirectional, I mean the propagation of energy, so which is given by group velocity. <laughs> so and yes, they are assumed to those B waves that at large scale uh, propagate energy eastward. So those waves, uh, whatever the value of k, propagate energy eastward. Uh, this one propagate energy eastward. But if you look at the phase, phase velocity, so omega over k, then it's another st uh, story. Change sign from uh, this to there. And this can be confusing when looking at uh, observ uh, observation uh, is not always clear if you see the wave the phase speed, or if you are not used to it, or the group uh, velocity. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, but yes, but recently, uh, over the last few years, there has been uh, uh, many uh, progress to add little by little nonlinearities. The Poorsman approach to do this is just to put nonlinearity, to put a mean flow, and linearize around this mean flow. Okay, this is still linear theory, but then there are also uh, approach uh, that uh, assume a weak linearity and that start from the linear case and little by little deform the spectrum by tuning the amplitude of the wave that becomes a parameter and that allows you to obtain, they are not as uh, robust and strong result as in those uh, linear emission case, but, uh, there are beginning to be some results on those nonlinear cases. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's, it's very, there are very different tools because uh, it's look at uh, all the, the fluid uh, scenes uh, uh, as uh, you look at the continuous deformation of uh, your, uh, your fluid, and you look at the topological property of this complicated object. This is completely different uh, 
from uh, the approach here, which is to uh, look at an object, which is a collection uh, uh, of uh, vectors, complex uh, vector parameterized over a closed surface. So uh, this is, there is some, but in physics, in many fields of physics, there are a lot of tools from topology. It's just that they are, do not necessarily describe the same object. And this is not the same family of objects that are described. But there are work, other work by Arnold, Arnold, who looks at those kind of objects in different uh, contexts than those uh, free waves. I have two questions. So the first thing, first one is you talked about water this whole time, but you also have you why is, is this not also true of the atmosphere? Like would you not see this these same yes. proportions? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, because the uh, the uh, answer is not so rapid, but let me try. Um, okay, what you can do is what you have to do for the atmosphere, but also for the ocean, actually. You have a fluid that is rotating, but also stratified. But you can take the same limit of uh, shallow, the shallow water limit. But uh, then you have a three-dimensional fluid, a stratification, and, uh, but still a rotation. And then something magical happens is that uh, uh, you can uh, simply, if you assume infinite, uh, okay, no, I should not take this. Okay, you can decompose into a vertical mode, and the modes at the linear level will be decoupled from each other. And each vertical mode uh, is described by an effective shallow water. The mapping between this simple shallow water model and the shallow water model that is relevant to describe the atmosphere, like here. And actually, this is why I, I, I didn't want to spend time to describe precisely what are those lines, but those lines, they are uh, fit, correspond to different phase uh, velocity. And the phase velocity itself uh, uh, depends on uh, your projection on the vertical uh, mode. You can, for a given value of phase velocity, you can uh, make a step back and say, okay, I was with this, I'm describing mostly uh, this vertical mode or this other. So this is not so straightforward uh, to you. You are right. It's a good so, question. So you should accept similar behavior. And have yes. Process. And then the second question is why? So, I mean, these modes can exist, but why should they be the dominant one that you actually see? Like, why no, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent, uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if it is a mystery, but, uh, or not, but this is striking. It is, uh, why it is, uh, why does it come out from observation uh, so clearly? Is it because the forcing uh, uh, projects uh, is so strong that it projects well of the mode, but then it, there are so many perturbations? Uh, that, uh, from a condensed matter's perspective, it's usually because all the, it's like the lowest energy mode and everything else is far away energetically. So I was wondering if there was a similar type argument here or is it something else? So one, uh, it's really speculation what I say, but uh, one but one fact is that you you see a strong signature in the gap here, and uh, it is known that when you have uh, many waves in a system uh, at some uh, frequency and you excite it, then the waves can talk to each other and exchange energy, and then the energy is crumbled. So the, while uh, in this part of the spectrum, okay, it's a nonlinear fluid, so you can talk with everybody, but. Uh, if no, non-linearity are sufficiently weak, uh, it will be harder to spread energy for, to other modes. But uh, really, I have not the answer to this question. Do you have like analogy to Yes, the question is, so, go back to the original model. Yes. So the, okay, okay. So the the uh, the answer to this question uh, came uh, actually at the same time as Matsuno is uh, is a paper by Lunga Higgins, a hundred page paper with a very a very uh, heavy uh, math. And that's the beauty of Matsuno computation is that he came up with the same result but in a simple case which is solvable and that everybody can understand. And but if you look at uh, the Longa Higgins paper, it's really an, a very uh, beautiful piece of applied math. Uh, the the results are pretty much the same with small some differences, and this is still a subject of research actually. 
to have a precise description of the mode. And one difference, for instance, is that uh, the Kelvin waves become non-dispersive and uh, the, the velocity uh, in the meridional uh, direction uh, is non it's small, but non-zero. And also, uh, uh, if you come back to the sphere, as was noticed uh, by uh, you uh, before, the Earth is not infinite. And so what we see is rather points like this. Uh, K is quantized. And it's not so obvious to say whether this is a, a mode that uh, cross the gap here. If you put number of uh, the step here, you, it becomes impossible to say that uh, you get uh, this mode that transit or not. It's a mix of the different modes. So uh, it becomes similar to Massino in the limit uh, where the sphericity of the Earth uh, becomes, uh, uh, the, when the Earth becomes very large, uh, keeping the uh, constant uh, the trapping length scale. Yes, so, okay, so that's an intermediate step with La Laplace. You could remove uh, the curvature effect of the Earth, but you keep this effect through the variation of the Curry's parameter. And uh, then uh, the solution. Uh, uh, is uh, identical with, um, yes, is identical in the sense that you will have this non-dispersive wave, V equals zero, and uh, the shape will be a bit different, but uh, the solution will be the same. Yes. And this is the, the, the outcome of topology, is that uh, by computing the topological invariant in the simpler problem, and by invoking a, a, an index theorem that say that this spectral flow is, is ruled by this topological number. Uh, it's an indication that what you found with this particular profile will remain true for any profile. But going to Laplace, it's trickier because uh, there is the, a new term, which is curvature. And uh, also there is the, the, the boundedness of the, the sphere that comes into play. Okay, we should stop here and think that